Good morning, brothers and sisters, and very happy Sabbath. As we return to the study that we've engaged in over the last several weeks, shall we thank our Heavenly Father for his blessing and for the guidance that he is providing so that we may more completely see that which is necessary for us at this time in this earth's history. Shall we seek him now in prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you on this Sabbath and we thank you for this time of rest, for this time of blessing, for your guidance, and for the words that are presented for this time. Help us, Father, that we may accept the admonition that is being presented. Guide us so that we may accept this, so that things may occur within our lives that will bring us more in harmony with our brothers and sisters, with those around us, and with the work that you would have us to do. We ask, Father, that your angels may attend us. We ask for your spirit so that we may more properly understand. We thank you for this opportunity. We praise you for your loving kindness. We ask you now to bless this meeting and bless those that are attending in person and those that will view this later. For this, we thank you, and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. We have a brief recap. When Christ's ambassadors present the gospel in its simplicity, and the hearers respond to the word presented, Nothing is so gratifying to the heart of infinite love than for these souls to come to him confessing their sins and giving expression to their faith and to the truth. For he delights to impart to them his righteousness. When the question comes <clears throat> from the anxious soul, what shall I do to be saved? The answer returns, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and thou shalt be saved. Here we are to see Acts 16, 30, and 31. Angels rejoice to see hearts open to receive the communication of light and love and pardon. When thanksgiving arises from human hearts because souls are receiving the impress of Christ, Heavenly beings take up the song of praise. The, pro the prophet Zephaniah writes, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not, and to Zion, Let not thine hand be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. <clears throat> he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Zephaniah 3, 16 and 17. And will not the soul redeemed render to the sin-pardoning Savior his love and homage? Yes, verily. With the psalmist he will sing, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me, and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man that maketh the Lord his trust, and respecteth not 
the proud, and such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works that thou hast done, and thy thoughts, which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. <clears throat> if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Psalm 40, 1 to 5. Now, when we are seeing this, where he is lifting us up out of an horrible pit and out of the miry clay, what prophet in the Bible do we also find giving reference to a situation that has to do with miry clay? Well, Daniel chapter 2. Exactly. This psalm is being written for those at the end of the world. To give us instruction and give us hope in all that is to, to occur. The man who loves God will not only offer him lip service, in praise and thanksgiving, but he will bring to the treasury his gifts and offerings that laborers may be sent forth to sow the precious seed. Will you show by your lives that you are seeking precious pearls? You are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. 1 Corinthians 3.9 God and man combine their efforts in this work. <clears throat> Christ calls his people to unity, to bind themselves together in the bands of Christian fellowship. Let those who have named the name of Christ cease their criticism and bind up with one another and with Christ. Let them cherish feelings of tenderness and love and not think it a virtue to differ. Christ's workmen will have to guard jealously their own spirit, lest they allow Satan to come in and weaken them through disunion. Where there is union, there is strength. Let all your devising tend to bind you together, that ye may be complete in Christ. Here again, Mrs. White is being extremely direct. She is being extremely direct to the movement, to the church, to the world. Yet, the world will have none of this. The movement needs this. What we will see from the church may be those rare souls that will indeed become those of the Levites. We do not have room today to spend time in criticism of others. She's being very direct here. Where there is union, there is strength. <clears throat> the word of God demands that we be one with Christ as he was one with the Father. That the apostle that says the apostle, you may be children of your father, which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 45. The Lord is not pleased with variance and strife. And if his people will work intelligently and harmoniously, God will work with them and will work through them. 
But if they spend time and energy in strife for the supremacy, God will leave them in their weakness, for he will never work with unconsecrated elements. God calls for pure spirited workers. <clears throat> as we've been studying these last several weeks. We have a message from the, from the prophet Zephaniah. Here we're being told that if we, like the apostles before us, are going to spend time in trying to decide who is the greatest among us, then we will be left behind. This is not my words, brothers and sisters. These are the words before you. The words of the prophet. If they spend time and energy <clears throat> in strife for supremacy, God will leave them in their weakness for he will never work with unconsecrated elements. Have we not seen this situation occur before? Did we not see that there was strife looking for supremacy after October 22nd, 1844? Was there strife and seeking for supremacy in the upper room after Christ went back to the heavenly courts? Do we not have these two examples as to what our responsibility is today? I submit to you now. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. For the choice now is yours. A new commandment I give unto you, Christ says, <clears throat> that you love one another as I have loved you, <clears throat> that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have love for one another, John 13, 34, and 35. Unity is a test of discipleship. If we are not unified, we are then not disciples. Does this make sense to you? Yes. Mm -hmm. As the Father hath loved me, so I have loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be, the, be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. John 15, 9 to 12. We are going to be called to give a message to the world. These statements by Jesus are going to be the bedrock of that that will go to the world. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. If you love me, keep my commandments is another statement. How often could this be repeated? If you love me, keep my commandments. 
and yet the commandments not be fully understood. How often do we say to those that have been denominated as God's last church that we need the reliance upon not only the commandments, but also on prophecy? And how often have prophecy been set aside? The enemy of souls will put forth every effort to hinder this work of the heart. He will seek to place his mark of division and strife upon God's people. Whose mark of division and strife is this? Uh, that would be Satan. So if we are marked with his mark, under whose banner are we standing? Again, that would be Satan's. There are only two classes. If we stand under Satan's banner, are we standing for Christ or against him? Against. This enemy is to be steadfastly resisted by every individual soul. This is not to be done corporately. It's not to be done as part of a group. It's not to be done as part of a church. This is this enemy is to be steadfastly resisted by every individual soul. For salvation is an individual work. <clears throat> we inquire of those who claim to be followers of Christ. Will you resist the devil that he may not weaken and destroy God's heritage? Or will you unite with the enemy of righteousness to do his work and dishonor God? This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, 4. Christ's prayer for his followers was, The glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, <clears throat> I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, <clears throat> that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also with whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold thy glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. Interesting. Hang on. And these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. John 17, 22 to 26. When God's people work together harmoniously and intelligently, Christ's request for them will be fulfilled. I apologize. I don't understand why that was uh, blanked out earlier, at least from what I was saying. So when God's people work together harmoniously and intelligently 
then <clears throat> will Christ's request to the Father for them be fulfilled. If we're not willing to work together, if like those after October 22nd, 1844, we find that there are divisions and those that will not work with us. We will need to listen to the admonition of another prophet. And accept that Ephraim is joined to his idols. Let him alone. We may attempt to do everything we can, but there will be those that will refuse to be united, that yeah. will refuse to stop criticizing. Now, we do know uh, we had Ephraim um, addressed in our study of the judges. Yes. In, and in two different places. Yep. Agreed. So we, had it, we had it with the story of Gideon. Correct? Correct. And then we had it with um, the story of, uh, what's his name? I can't think of his name. Um, remind me, what's his name? Uh, when Ephraim. When Ephraim Jephthah. came to accuse. Jephthah. Yes. Right. So we, we have, and th those two accounts are different. Yes. So in the one, um, in Gideon's, he basically um, pacifies them with his response. Uh, but that doesn't really happen in Jephthah's conflict with Ephraim. No, it doesn't. <laughs> it ends up in, in um, quite the opposite. So... So, I mean, in looking at those two examples, we can see that it shows that that Ephraim, in a sense, in this sense, is divided. In one case, Ephraim uh, is pacified, in the other one, it isn't. So, so when we 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 look at this situation, I would say that um, in both cases, I mean, there's people that are going to be in either that are going to be represented in either case right so. in these situations this admonition has come to mind because Ephraim has been that which has typified Israel It's a sad thing when you see those that you love, that you care about, that choose to remain with their idols, that their idols are more important to them than Christ. It is a harsh thing, but a very loving thing to have to accept that Ephraim is joined to his idols let him alone now <clears throat> this manuscript that we've been reading from was from October 7th 1899 when Mrs. White was yet in Australia This manuscript was then used to partially help put together the Review and Herald article that is going to follow. The manuscript was unpublished. The Review and Herald article, a very brief article, was published on the 5th of June of 1900, 241 days after she first wrote this above manuscript. 
if we are truly to become co-workers with Christ, we must be unified with our brethren and sisters. For unity is a test of discipleship. Can Christ work with those that are not unified? That would be no. Now, the first paragraph here, I think, is something that we can bring very quickly to our minds. When the disciples were disputing as to which should be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Christ called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And who shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But who sh whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my father. The human agent is a saver of life unto life. For he is a saver or he is a saver of death unto death. He either draws with Christ or he draws away from Christ. Co-workers with Christ will manifest no harshness, no self-sufficiency. These elements must be purified from the soul, and the gentleness of Christ will take possession. Never should unkindness be shown to any soul, to any soul. For by the grace of God, that soul may become an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. Bruise not the hearts of Christ's purchased ones, for in so doing, you bruise the heart of Christ. She really gets with it in this second paragraph, doesn't she? She really tells it like it is. The question is, are we willing to listen? A soul hurt is often a soul destroyed. Let those who have light and privileges remember that their very position of trust makes them responsible for souls. They will have to meet again around the great white throne, the souls whom they have driven from Christ, bruised and wounded to death. How many would like to be involved in a meeting like this? Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble needs, the apostle writes, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Hebrews 12, 12 to 15. That is, let not your coldness, your unkindness, 
turn souls from the path that leads to Christ. There are souls who need your words of encouragement, and these cannot be helped by your unfeeling decisions and words and looks of contempt. Christ calls men to unity to bind themselves together in the bands of Christian fellowship. Those who have named the name of Christ, he calls to cease their criticism and bind up with one another and with God. If we are to bind up with one another, are we not to seek to be restored in fellowship with one another? Does this mean that we are to lay aside those things that we have learned if we find that one wishes to be bound to us, but wishes still to hold on to their ideas? Is that truly coming into unity? If God's people will work intelligently and harmoniously, he will work with them and through them. But if they spend time and energy in a strife for the supremacy, God will leave them in their weakness, for he will not work with unconsecrated elements. The word of God demands that we be one with Christ, as he is one with the Father, that Christ said, Ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. Matthew 5, 45. The Redeemer did not shun man as man is inclined to shun his fellow men. When God condemned the guilty sinner because he was deserving of condemnation, the majesty of heaven came near in all the fullness of the Godhead. He looked upon the world in its fallen, corrupted state, and his heart of love was burdened because of the woe of the human creatures. He looked for the central power of all evil, and he beheld the great apostate, the fallen angel who had been expelled from the heavenly courts, and who had assumed the power and the throne of God upon the earth. The Son of God read all the purpose of Satan to eclipse God from the view of man. And he knew that by paying the ransom, he could end the reign of the enemy and vindicate the judgment of God. Therefore, he clothed his divinity with humanity. He stooped to this fallen world that he might restore in man the divine image. Now, there's a question in the chat. How should we approach this question? How should we address this situation? What are your thoughts? Well, the way that we have addressed this is we do believe that um, God is using others. And um, and that doesn't just mean in this movement. It means all around the world in all different ways. Um, now, as far as we, we as shepherds should not leave one sheep behind, I'm not sure exactly how that relates to the question. Um, because we... We aren't given as shepherds over the whole flock. That's Christ. So we have a sphere of influence, and we shouldn't do anything to, to hurt the flock. Okay. If we were to do something that would hurt the flock, are we then shepherds? 
No. Evidently not. If we do something to hurt the flock, are we then working with Christ or against Christ? These are things that we have to be considering. As his prophetic eye saw the results of his sacrifice, Christ exclaimed, Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw men unto me. John 12, 31, 32. But this is yet just a partial reading of these verses. Would someone please look up John 12, 31 and 32 and read them in their complete version? Okay, here is where it is. John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And, if, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And men, in this case, is a supplied word. So, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. <clears throat> but this is being given to us as part of the judgment of this world. Is this indeed not for the time in which we currently live? Are we not being given this admonition by Christ himself for the time which we are now experiencing? Mm, that's my understanding. Okay. In the place where Satan has his seat, there will I set my cross. Those that so choose to be unified with Christ and with their brothers and sisters will see the seat of Satan removed and the cross of Christ erected. I will stand at the head of humanity. Though my merit, through my merits, man will stand on vantage ground. I will be the great center to draw all men to Christ, to God. As under the rule of Satan, evil influences have conspired for the ruin of man. So under my rule, the influence of my servants shall form a power to restore. The legions of hell will combine with the prince of darkness to oppose the laws of the kingdom of Christ. But to every man, it, I will give his work. And with this work, I will give power to win souls to God. Every human being who will receive and believe in me, I will use in winning back the world to God. Whom do we look to be used by? 
The redemption of man means unity with Jesus Christ. What is the antithesis of this statement? Those that refuse to be redeemed are in unity with the great apostate. The Savior pledged himself to recover the principles of human dependence upon a plan that could save and reform man. He would make man a laborer together with God. By the sacrifice of himself, he would enable every human being to be one with his fellow men and with God. All the elements of the human character, he would make sanctified instruments to carry out the Lord's great plan to rescue souls from the snares of the enemy, that they might behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This plan unites the believers to God as one man. One rule of life is the principle of action, a chain of mutual dependence made fast to the throne of God, passes round every blood-bought soul. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Romans 11.33 In the divine economy, God has made provision that man may be a partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Reformative influences destroy the desire to do evil. The holy agencies of heaven sanctify the soul and choose the human agent to do service for God. It is the work of God to expel evil from the soul by connecting humanity with divinity. All difference and disunion are destroyed by a union with the great center. What does this statement mean to each one of us? If all difference and disunion are destroyed by a union with the great center, if we continue to see difference and disunion, then whom are we choosing to be unified with? God's people are made one with Christ, and the Father loves them as he loves his own Son. Powerful words, powerful admonition. Man stands in need of just such a firm, abiding life principle, a principle which will connect him with God and through God with his fellow man. And God stands in need of just such workers, men and women who are pure in spirit, compassionate, humble, men and women who are one with Christ as he is one with the Father. Christ prayed to the Father, the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, <clears throat> which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them my name. And will declare it. That the love wherewith thou hast loved me. May be in them and I in them. John 17, 22 to 26. When God's people work together harmoniously and intelligently. Christ's request to the father for them 
will be fulfilled. She had amazing instruction as to why this admonition was to be given. Manuscript 68, 1900. God's people to be living epistles. This was not published. It was typed on the 30th of November of 1900. In God's arrangements with his people in ancient times, directions are given in the faithful recognition of the gracious and marvelous works which he had done in delivering the children of Israel from bondage and slavery and giving them a goodly heritage and dwelling places. The first fruits of the earth were to be consecrated to God and given back to him as an offering of gratitude and acknowledgement of his goodness for them. For, said they, when we cried unto the Lord of our fathers, the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppressors. And the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. And he hath brought us into this place, and hath given us this land, even a land that floweth with milk and honey. And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me. Deuteronomy 26, 7 through 10. Concerning this offering, the Lord has said, and thou shalt eat, it, shall set it before the Lord thy God, and shall worship before the Lord thy God. And thou shalt rejoice in every good thing which the Lord thy God hath given me. And unto thine house, thou and the Levite and the stranger that is among you. When thou hast made an end of tithing all the tithes of thine increase the third year, which is the year of tithing. And hath given it unto the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, that they may eat within thy gates and be filled. Deuteronomy 26, 10 to 12. This was to be a standing requirement. This day the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes and judgments. Thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Thou hath avouched the Lord this day to be thy God, and to walk in his ways, and to keep his statutes, and his commandments, and his judgments, and to hearken unto his voice. Deuteronomy 26, verse 16. This is not the voice of man. It is the voice of Jesus Christ enshrouded in the pillar of cloud. Read carefully all of this chapter of Deuteronomy and all of the chapters of 27 and 28. For here are stated plainly the blessings of obedience. Brothers and sisters, why was it so important that Deuteronomy 26, 27, and 28 be chapters that are admonished that they should be read. Are these repeating admonitions that had gone before? Is this giving a repeat from another section of scripture? Or is this something new? The concepts are repeated, right? But the details may be different. Okay. I would agree. 
But in this situation, the final words, for here are stated plainly the blessings of obedience. What do we find in Leviticus 26? Do we not find here the blessings and the curses? Do we not find here the admonition that we would call the seven times? It is written. So then here is Moses in his last statements to the children of Israel, repeating again the blessings and the curses that will befall them if they do not hold on to the entire, the complete law of God. We are told to compare to read carefully all of Leviticus 26. But we are told here <clears throat> to read carefully all of this chapter, chapter 26 of Deuteronomy, and the two chapters that follow. Do we not seek the blessings of obedience rather than the curses of disobedience? These directions which the Lord has given to his people express the principles of the law of the kingdom of God. And they are made specific so that the minds of the people may not be left in ignorance and uncertainty. Lest they should forget these important directions, Christ uttered them with his own voice. These precautions and decided practical demonstrations were essential to remind them that the obedience to the commandments of God was for their present and future good. Obedience brings prosperity. Disobedience results in a curse. Can she be any more plain? These scriptures present the never-ceasing obligation of all whom God has blessed with life and health and advantages in temporal and spiritual things. When the Lord in a special manner favors his people, he expects them to publicly acknowledge this. Thus, the name of God will be glorified, for it is a testimony that his word is verity and truth. Please read 1 Kings 8, 55 to 61. What do we find here? Is there someone that could read this section for us today? Okay, uh, Dwight, which, which yeah. section should we first should Kings. I go to the should I go to the Bible and read first Kings? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Oh, okay. That's what... first Kings eight, fifty five to sixty one. First Kings 8, is that what you said? Yes. 
55 through 61. I'm scrolling. Uh, and he stood and blessed all the congregation of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he promised. Here there hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all the ways and keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. And let these words wherewith I have made supplication before the Lord be nigh unto the Lord our God day and night, that he maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel at all times, as the matter shall require, that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is none else. Let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as at this day. Here we have the prayer of Solomon. At the the prayer offered at the benediction as they are dedicating the temple. Now, if we were to look at this just, just a little bit further, we know that the king, Solomon, and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. Now, in this situation, Solomon was dedicating not just the temple, but was making it clear that the people needed to be dedicated in order to be blessed. If the word of the Lord were now as strictly carried out, as it was enjoined upon, in, upon ancient Israel, fathers and mothers would give an example to their children, which would be of the greatest value. If instruction in the word were given in the family, God and his angels would be continually ministering in such households. Every temporal blessing would be received with gratitude. And every spiritual blessing would become doubly precious because the, the perception of each member of the household had been sanctified. Not just justified, but sanctified. The Lord Jesus is very nigh to those who thus appreciate all his precious gifts all his gracious gifts, tracing all their good things back to the benevolent, loving, caretaking God and recognizing that they come from the great fountain of all comfort and consolation whose supply is inexhaustible. God would have every family that he is preparing for the eternal mansions above give glory to him for all the rich treasures of his grace. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Matthew 4.10 The first fruits are not accepted by God unless presented in a spirit of reverence and gratitude. It is the humble, grateful, reverential heart that makes all offerings as a sweet-smelling savor, acceptable, unto God. The children of Israel might have given all their substance, but had it been given in a spirit of self-sufficiency or in the spirit of Phariseeism, as though God were indebted to them for the favors which they had received, 
their offerings would have been unaccepted, utterly contemned of God. Thou shalt rejoice in every good thing. Deuteronomy 26, 11. Were children by precept and example thus educated and trained in the home life? We should see a vital element of heavenly grace as a great educating force circulating through all of our schools. If parents would give this class of education to their children, there would be cheerfulness in the home life and the youth would bring a spirit of reverence with them into the schoolroom. And what then? Would there be an attendance in the sanctuary where God meets with his people, an attendance at all his appointed holy ordinances in the worship of God? And in all these would be expressions of thankfulness for the enjoyment of the gifts of his providence. Thanksgiving and praise should be expressed for whatever comforts God bestows upon families. By thus diligently and economically trading upon our Lord's goods, we may increase our store and be able to impart of the same to those who have fallen into distress. Thus we become the Lord's right hand to work out his benevolent purposes and to fulfill to him our covenant relation, which is expressed in his word. There is to be no withholding, for the specifications set forth in the word of God are not dictates of human wisdom. This day the Lord thy God hath commanded thee to do these statutes and judgments. Thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Deuteronomy 26, 16. In duty and expressed gratitude we are to obey God, for this is keeping his commandments and obeying his laws. In obeying God, we are express. In obeying God, we express his character. The purpose of all God's commandments is to reveal the duty of man, not only to God, but to his fellow men. In this late age of the soul, in the year 1900 and 1901, we are not to question or dispute these requirements because of the selfishness of our hearts. Isn't it amazing that we are now 122 years, 121 to 122 years further from when this admonition was written? We are not by our carelessness and hypocrisy to deceive and rob our own souls of the richest blessings of the grace of God, but our whole heart and mind and soul are to be melted into God's heart and mind and soul. Then the binding force of God's covenant, framed by the dictates of infinite wisdom and made binding by the power and authority of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, will be to us a pleasure. God will have no controversy with us in regard to these binding precepts. It is enough to understand that obedience to his statutes and his laws is the life and prosperity of all who obey them. The covenant is mutual. By being obedient to his word, we testify before angels and men that we live in every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We have avouched and solemnly owned and confessed that the Lord Jehovah is our God, our prince, and our ruler. This is by human choice. We render implicit obedience by eating the word, which is spirit and life.
at the baptismal ceremony. We virtually take a most solemn oath in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Are we taking an oath here to that which is of man? Are we taking an oath to a church? Or are we taking this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? That henceforth our lives will be merged into the life of these three great individual agencies. That the life we now live in the flesh, we will live in faithful obedience to God's sacred and holy law, keeping all of his statutes and his commandments. That we will live the newness of life as men and women having a new birth unto God. We, as newborn souls, born to live in the newness of life, acknowledge God's covenant that we are in reality pledging ourselves by a solemn oath to seek henceforth those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. By our profession of faith, we acknowledge the Lord as our God and pledge ourselves to obey his commandments. In a situation like this, in what Mrs. White is presenting for us today, can we see that she is telling us directly that by giving this oath, we are saying that we will follow God, that we will follow Christ, but we will be unified with him. Now, if we are unified with him, why are we having such a difficult time being unified with our other brothers and sisters? What do you think? Well, we're, we're still very, very much susceptible to human nature. And it's not until we realize that, uh, not just fundamentally, but take it in, until any of those changes will, will ever be addressed in, in my life. Okay. As I accept these things, I find it easier and easier to, to comply. But it's just, you know, um, I don't know, I'm 60 something <laughs> and just just starting to get a handle on it. Aren't we all? Well, yeah, I think it's a daily thing, really. I mean, you know, I think that's kind of what Paul meant by I die daily. Isn't it for all of us a daily thing? Yeah, I mean, it has to be, you know, the sun goes down, the sun comes up, it's a different day. We can't listen via our open mouth. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I said we can't listen via our open mouth. Right? <laughs> okay. And a comment from the chat, which I think is very apropos for all of us. We should pray for that transformation because we really need it. And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people as he hath promised thee, and that thou shouldst keep all of his commandments, and to make thee high above all nations, which he hath made in praise, and in name, and in honor. 
that thou mayest be a holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he, as he hath spoken. Verses 18 and 19. God accepts us that in true praise we may glorify his wisdom and his majesty in a world of apostasy and idolatry. Please read Zephaniah 3, 14 to 20. The Lord will have his people stand true to his honor and carefully guard the interests of one another. Our purpose in examining these so-called minor prophets has been put before us time and again. The synopsis that the Lord will have his people stand true to his honor and will carefully guard the interests of one another. Each of us will be presented with this. Each of us will we stand true to God's honor. And will we choose to carefully guard the interests of each other? Would you stop? You would wish me to stop? He was talking to his dog. I know that. We all have, we, we have these issues that happen. All ye are brethren, Matthew 23, 8. The Am Lord, I still, did you still, did anybody mute me or unmute me? Because I, 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 I thought I was muted. It, it had actually said that I was muted while you guys were responding to my. <laughs> that happens sometimes. I muted you. Okay. The Lord has entrusted money and advantages to his stewards, that they may guard the interests of one another, that there may be a continual praise to God, that there may be unity among his covenant-keeping people, that they may be praise in the earth, a people that God can bless with still greater advantages, both temporal and spiritual, thus honoring them above the transgressors of his law. God employs his people to do his sacred work in the earth, to be his hand of ministration in imparting these blessings and gifts to one another. The whole gospel from Genesis to Revelation is the means appointed and specified of God through which to reveal his will to the people. And it is to be appreciated, respected, and heeded. In this fourth chapter of Ephesians, the plan of God is plainly and simply revealed that all his children may lay hold upon the truth. Here is revealed the means which he has appointed to keep his church in that oneness and agreement, that they may reveal to the unbelieving world a healthful religious experience. Those who conform their lives in obedience to the commandments of God and are united in the faith of the scriptures, those who are bound together as one in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, their lives hid with Christ in God, will practice the golden rule and will be a living, abiding testimony that the Father loves them, even as he loves his only begotten Son. Again, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, you will watch out for the interests of one another. It's a choice. 
Are we willing to show in our lives our love for one another? Or are we choosing to reject the love of God? They appreciate the great gift of God to our world. Their course of life testifies that Christ has not died for them in vain. And they make use of all the provisions supplied them of heaven to reach and draw all souls to the obedience of the holy law of God. By thus becoming partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, they cooperate with the great working heavenly appliances. They become the Lord's channels through which he works, laborers together with God. Their consistent Christian lives magnify the law of God and make it honorable before a gainsaying world. Their behavior recommends obedience to the commandments of God and demonstrates to the world that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Is this not the kind of testimony <clears throat> that we are to offer before the world? Is this not the kind of statement, the kind of sermon that the Lord would have us to give to this world at this time in this earth's history? This is telling us we need to be an example, not in our words, but in our actions. Again, if you love me, keep my commandments. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. 1 Corinthians 3.9 the perfection of Christian character is a living testimony that God lives and that his power is working miracles upon his self-denying, consecrated followers. Those who love one another as Christ has loved them bear a living testimony that unseen agencies are working upon human hearts, bringing them into conformity to the divine word. It is the design of God that in the unity of the testimony of those who believe in Jesus Christ, the gospel should be expressed before the world. It is his purpose that those upon whom he has bestowed the gift of his own son should cooperate with him in saving others. In Christ is embraced all the children of God. They are members of one family and should help one another to recover from the suffering, which is a result of the unfortunate burden of debt. All who are in Christ must have that unity which exists between the Father and the Son and must love one another as brethren. What does this say to us today? What is this presenting before us? If these characteristics are not manifest in the lives of those who believe the truth, if in their lives the principles of the law of God are not demonstrated to an unbelieving world, if professed believers act out of the perversity of the sinner, they need to be converted before they can be trusted with responsibilities. For in their own lives and in their association with others, they evidence that there is a deficiency, a departure from the righteous principles of the law of Jehovah. This separates their souls from God so that they do not receive the quickening, discerning influence of the divine mind. 
the human mind is not fashioned and molded by God because its capacities are not working out the divine principles contained in the law of God. The power of God is not seen in their spiritual discernment, in their choice of words, or in their care to preserve the fragrance of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> <clears throat> the whole of the third chapter of Ephesians is a lesson for all teachers, for all ministers of the gospel, and for all who occupy responsible positions in the work of God. And when their imperfections of character are manifest in spirit or in action, setting a wrong example in their families, in the school, in the church, or in the world, Unless they become converted, they should be advised to take up some other calling where they will not in character act the spirit of the unbeliever and lead others in the wrong direction. Very pointed instruction here. very specific admonition to each of us at this time. The blessings of grace for which Christ's sake the Lord bestows upon those who believe are the fruits of his eternal purpose that all believers shall adorn the doctrine of Christ our Savior. This doctrine must permeate our entire lives, our whole lives, that its influence may be felt in the family, in the church, and in all business connections with the world. This alone can distinguish us as those who keep the commandments of God. As did Christ in his human nature, so we are to show to the universe of heaven, to the church, and to the world that we are living the principles of the law of the kingdom of heaven. Does this mean that if we are emboldening a spirit of criticism of others, that we are not walking according to the law of God. Yeah, that's what the that's what that all says, basically. If we're not walking according to the law of God, then we are no better than any other that chooses not to claim the name of Christ. We should Dwight, not guess. I have a question. Um, I, you know, it's pertinent. Uh, I noticed at the top of this stuff, it says uh, previously unpublished. Yep. Uh, so when was it published? I believe this was published in 2015. Okay. That's, this is kind of what I was thinking. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry to disturb you. No, no, no. You're not disturbing me. So this, this brings up a point. How long ago was this published? Yeah, just a few years ago. Seven years ago. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry. No, 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 no. I mean, when we consider this, all of these admonitions pointing out our need to understand the seven times, our need not to be critical of other brothers and sisters, our need to be fully converted, had been held back until seven years 
years ago. Not even in the manuscript releases was this particular manuscript referenced. Hmm. So since 1863, since the founding of the church, until 2015, this manuscript had remained unpublished. Well, what's fascinating is, is that it came out before um, 2019. Yes. And um, it, it, if somebody would have done a righteousness by faith uh, study, might have come across this. <laughs> it, isn't I'm it just saying. <laughs> I mean, isn't it interesting how this supports so much of what we've been studying on Friday nights? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. Um, these are the amazing things to me. I mean, <laughs> the coincidences that people like to refer to, I, I see not as coincidences. Exactly. Instead, it's um, I'm a practitioner of JIT. Right. Which mean, which means just in time sure. <laughs> in my in my in my labors uh, in the industry. And it just kind of fits in so closely to yes, the outside does. education I've been getting as well as the inside education. And when I mean the inside, you know, having the inside track, which is, you know, King James's uh, Holy Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Interesting. It is. I'm sorry. I, I, I digress. No, you're fine. We should not be as orphans, sad and discouraged, but should show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. This document, unpublished for so long, revealed seven years ago is more light for our path. And we are not only to acknowledge the Lord as our God and ruler, but we may call him by the endearing name of Father. Our countenances should express his love. Our lives should tell of his goodness because the sanctified soul trusts in him. And the heart meditates upon his goodness, patience, long forbearance, and his compassion. Now. Those are actually the character traits. His goodness. Right. right? And uh, patience. Yes. Long, long forbearance. And compassion. So that's one, two, three, four, four, four things. That we can that, also be applying with the messages of Revelation 14 and 18. Does God want any not to be saved? Uh, no. But many will choose not to be saved. Mm. Many will make the choice that they would rather walk according to the fire from the sparks of their own kindling than walk in the light that is provided by God. It's amazing that so many would make that kind of choice. Brothers and sisters, as we have said for many weeks, we seek to be unified. Much like those from the, at the time 
from when Christ returned to the heavenly courts. We have a work that is to be done between us. But we can only accomplish this work if we are willing to set aside our differences, willing to set aside our sins, and willing to be fully unified with our brethren so that we may then be fully unified with God. We may reach out the hand to be unified with brothers and sisters, and we may find that hand is slapped away. We must go forward if it is slapped away. We may make the offer, as Christ did to the rich young ruler. Who stated that he had kept all of the precepts since his youth. Yet when he was told by the Savior to give all that you have and follow me. He could not do it, for he was very rich. That which he held on to was more precious to him than what Christ offered him. May this not be said of us. We've seen many things so far presented before us from the book of Zephaniah. We will be returning to Zephaniah 3 to look at the specifics of what this prophet presented and to examine what they mean for us today. At this time, we are now close to the close of our time together. Are there any questions or comments on what we have been covering? All seems pretty clear to me. Okay. One thing that um, got my caught, caught my mind as you were reading the last paragraph, last sentence. And the heart meditates upon his goodness, patience, longbearance, forbearance, and compassion. That word meditates. I think we all recognize his goodness, patience, long forbearance, and compassion. Right. But I need to meditate on it more. Amen. Don't we all? Notice it's 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 not saying the mind, it's saying the heart. <laughs> right. Uh, our, I guess that would be our compassion center, <laughs> which right. we we override all the time. All right. If there are no other comments or questions, shall we then close with prayer?
Gracious Heavenly Father, We thank you for your long forbearance with us, for your great compassion with us, for your patience and your goodness. May we meditate upon these things as has our father David, as we have been shown that we need to consider more carefully that which is presented before us. Direct us this day. Be with us. Help us so that that which is done may bring glory to your name. May your, glorif may your name be so glorified and so lifted up that it will help to draw others unto you. May your will be done in our lives. May we show by our actions that which you would have us to do. Be with us now on this Sabbath. Direct our steps. Direct our thoughts. But most of all, direct our words. For this, we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.